Good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me all right? See, see me all right, too? <laughs> A little bit of both. Hopefully. Yes? Perfect, perfect. I got one yes. All right, guys. I hope that you guys are all doing well. Welcome to Lecture 8. Can you believe it's Lecture 8 already? It's It's been going by pretty fast. We only have two lectures left after this, but uh, they get more fun because, as you guys are going to see in today's lecture, the theory part starts to shrink a little bit and the abacus examples start to expand. So in this lecture today, we just have a little bit of theory to go over. And most of it's not even really theory. It's more the implementation of theory into abacus. The theory itself, this is when I get to play a very special card called the prerequisite card. <laughs> so it's kind of a cheap trick, but one of the prerequisites of this course was solid mechanics or Civi 664. Uh, just out of curiosity, I know the Mechie guys probably haven't taken it, but for those Civi people out there, how many of you have taken Civi 664 solid mechanics? Just out of curiosity. All right, perfect. We got one. One. All right. Okay. Okay. So a lot of you guys have taken it. So as you guys remember, kind of later on in that course, one of the topics was plasticity, more specific isotropic hardening. So do you guys remember isotropic hardening, equivalent plastic strain, stuff like that, the incrementation? <laughs> Maybe not. A little bit. How was that topic? Was it fun? Not, not so much fun, but, uh, Hopefully you guys enjoyed it because that's basically what we're going to be doing today. But we're not going to be concerned about the theory of it all. The theory of it all was all covered in 664. And again, that was a prerequisite to this course. So I'm not expecting you guys to really know the theory. But that's kind of good for you guys because those of you who did not take 664, I'm not expecting you guys to go back and relearn the theory because it, it can be a bit complex. So what we're going to focus on today and in general in this course is how do we implement that isotropic hardening that we've already learned into our finite element programs? And that's going to be it. So if you guys come out of this lecture and you guys know how exactly we implement this into Abacus, that's all I'm looking for today, guys. So again, the theory, don't worry too much about it. So I'm going to throw up E class here. And as we can see, we're, we're definitely at the later end of the lecture. Now, I just want to bring your attention to a couple things. So the first is this right here. I added another part to lecture seven. I realized that at the end of lecture seven, due to time constraints, I was kind of running out of time on the concept that I wanted to get across to you guys. So I added this little section. It's not too big, and we're going to cover it first. It's basically what Abacus does in terms of the newton raphson method. We discussed the newton raphson method. By now, you guys are all experts. But we haven't really gone into detail of what Abacus is doing with that newton raphson method. So I just created this little set of slides here to show you guys what's going on. And we're going to cover that before we get into lecture 8 today. Now, when I talked about Lecture 8 beforehand, we had both metal plasticity as well as concrete plasticity. And I was looking at the set of lecture stuff today and said, all right, well, by the time we finish nonlinear multi-step analysis as well as metal plasticity, we get kind of tight on time. It's doable, but we didn't really have time for concrete plasticity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove concrete plasticity from this course. Now, those of you guys are saying, well, Clayton, I'm dealing with concrete or I'm dealing with masonry. I need to know concrete plasticity. Well, if that's the case, don't worry. I will create the notes for it and I'll put it down here in lecture number 11 here. So concrete plasticity is something I'll show you guys, but it will not be on the final exam. Okay, does that sound fair to you guys due to time constraints? I will show you guys concrete plasticity, but it will not be on the final exam. That's going to be kind of the goal here. So another thing I wanted to highlight too is in lecture 11 here, I did the linear analysis both in Mathematica as well as Abacus. I hope that you guys are able to see the videos. If you guys didn't have time, don't worry about it. Again, this extra stuff is just more for your extra learning benefits. If you guys feel like, hey, could use a little bit more practice, there you guys go. But if not, again, don't worry about it. I don't expect you guys to take time, extra time out of your days to basically learn this course. Now, one of the things I want to highlight here, because I was scared it was going to give you guys confusion, is in my linear analysis in Mathematica and Abacus, I assumed plane stress, plane stress. 
Now, because I assumed plain stress, both my Mathematica and my Abacus answers were identical. All right, they were both identical. But if you guys are doing plain strain, as you guys did in the assignment, well, actually, I'll ask you guys, because you guys most likely have done the assignment by now. If not, <laughs> you better hurry. Did you guys get the same stiffness matrix in Abacus as you guys did in Mathematica? Question for you guys. No, you guys did not. So if you guys are doing the assignments and was worried about that, don't worry about it. It's expected. One of the things that we have to realize is that Abacus is a finite element software. It's a software. We don't know what Abacus is actually doing in the background. That's why we do these kind of assignments to figure out, okay, is it close to what the theory is or is it a little bit different? You never know. So <laughs> it's kind of one of those funny things. Uh, for those of you who did an ANSYS, was it the exact same? That, that I'm actually curious about because I've never checked. Was a, uh, sorry, was ANSYS the exact same for plain strain? No? Okay, okay. So they're both the exact same. One of the things that you guys have been noticing is that when we start discussing these element formulations, there's a lot of different variations to try and increase runtime, increase stability, stuff like that. So the fact that a finite element software doesn't have the exact same answer, that shouldn't be shocking to us. Because again, they do a lot of different formulations to help increase accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. So after we finished that non, sorry, the linear analysis, we started moving into nonlinear analysis. And in this class, we're going to focus on three beasts, if you will. I like to think of this class as like Zelda, Breath of the Wild. Have you guys played that game at all? <laughs> or am I just uh, the big nerd here? You guys played Zelda, Breath of the Wild? Probably not. You're just laughing at me. Okay, that that's fine. That's fine. Well, basically what happens in that game is you start off in this nice little starting area. Everything's nice and fun. That's linear analysis. That was that was the fun part. We were we were laughing. We we're saying, oh, this is great. And then after that, the whole world opens up and then you get to go explore wherever you want. That's nonlinear analysis. So what happens in the game is there's these big beasts, divine beasts, the kind of the bosses, if you will. Well, we're going to start tackling each one of these bosses. And each one of these bosses is a different type of nonlinearity. So the first one that we encountered was geometric nonlinearity. That was the whole goal of last lecture. Now, for those of you guys using Abacus, or I guess it's the same in ANSYS, how did we tackle geometric nonlinearity? What did we do in Abacus to handle geometric nonlinearity? Exactly. Large deflections on, or basically that NL geom, we switched it to on. That's all we had to do. So nonlinear geometry, good to go. That's not a problem at all. Now we move on to the next one, which we're going to talk about today, and that is material nonlinearity. And today we're going to be focusing specifically on metals. As you guys know, if I have a piece of steel, start stretching it, there's going to be a point at which it yields. And then after it yields, it's strain hardness. So it increases strength a little bit, but then at a certain point, it starts to neck and then fail. So the question becomes, how do we incorporate that into our models? So that's going to be the boss we're tackling today. And then next lecture is the one that I think most of you guys are probably excited for. It's kinematic nonlinearity. So kinematic nonlinearity is things like contact. If I have two bodies pressing together, that creates a, a lot of nonlinearity between them. And we're going to have to discuss that next lecture. But again, that's next lecture. Today, we're going to be focusing on material plasticity models. So is there any questions real quick about the contents of this course? Or is everybody good to go, like the flow of it? Or are there any concerns at all from you guys? No concerns? I'm going to take silence as a, a kind of a good to go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Will you address kinematic hardening? So we won't really address kinematic hardening, but I was going to show you guys what exactly it is. In Abacus, it's simply switching a button. So uh, should I tell you guys? I'll, I'll tell you guys after what kin kinematic hardening is. But it's very simple to implement into Abacus, or I'm assuming ANSYS. I've never really worked with kinematic hardening in ANSYS. Again, we're going to be focusing today on isotropic hardening. All right, so if that's the only question, let's talk about something else. 
So it's come to my attention that maybe the final exam slash final project might might be a, a bit stressful for you guys. Are you guys stressed about the final exam or the final project? Just out of curiosity to the to the chat here. How are you guys feeling about it? Is it something you uh, lose sleep at night over? <laughs> Stressed about the submission date. About which one? The final project or the final exam? Final project. Final project. Okay. So let's talk about the final exam first then. So the final exam, what did we propose? We proposed April 5th to 9th. That, is that good to go for everybody? Everybody's pretty happy with the 5th to the 9th. Okay, so you guys are good with the final project. So the final exam right now, we had it on the 16th. 16th. So how about we move it one week to the 23rd? Will that make you guys happy? Will that, will that make a little bit of the stress go away? Yes? Yes? Okay. Sure. Perfect. Yes, so the project, we will move over to the 23rd. It'll now be due on the 23rd. And that's kind of the last date I could possibly have it without getting in trouble from the department. All right, so the 23rd, it works for me, works for you guys. That'll be the new date to the project. So I will update this later to the 23rd. It's no longer due on the 16th. We have an extra week to do it. Just want to make sure that you guys aren't stressed over this course. You guys shouldn't be stressed over this course. This is FEA. It's the fun course, <laughs> if you will. All right, so everyone's happy with that. Perfect. I'll move E-Class out of the way, and we're going to get started on today's lecture. So if there's any questions about anything to do with the course, uh, what do you guys think? Any questions about the course content, or are we good to go? What is the exam submission date? So it'll be due April 9th, I believe. It'll be due the Friday at, let's say, 5 p.m. Or I can do it the Saturday. What works for you guys? To me, I kind of like the Friday because then I don't force you guys to try and rush everything on the Saturday. You guys still want Saturday, though? <laughs> you guys don't want the whole weekend? All right, well, we can do it Saturday, but it's going to be early Saturday. So we can do it Saturday at noon. Do you guys prefer late Friday night or Saturday at noon? Two Saturdays. Okay, well, tentatively, we'll keep it as Saturday at noon. So I'll send an email about that actual official date. If you guys have any questions or concerns, please email me. And if I don't have any questions or concerns by, let's say, the end of the week this week, then I will set it in stone. I will put up the submission box and everything, and we can be good to go. I'll discuss what's going to be on the final exam more next week. All right, so I've already decided... Five questions. One question, it's going to be almost complete. I don't want to say theory because it's not going to be more theoretical. It's going to be short answer. That would be the best one. It's going to be short answer. And then after that, I'm going to give four basically written questions covering the concepts we learned in this course. Yes, you guys will probably need Mathematica. Yes, you guys will need Abacus or whatever finite element program you guys are using. So... Hopefully that answers the two most basic questions I usually get. All right. So again, we'll talk about it more next week. You guys have any questions or concerns, please email me. I don't want you guys to stress. I want you guys to be nice and happy. That's what this course is all about. All right. Good to go, guys. Let's uh, let's jump into today, today's lecture. So the main goal of today's lecture is going to be that metal plasticity or isotropic hardening. Again, as one of our students mentioned in chat, we also have kinematic hardening. And I'll discuss what kinematic hardening is after. It's actually not too much different than isotropic hardening. Usually there's a combination of both. But uh, I'll discuss what it is in an abacus. I'll show you guys kinematic hardening. It's just simply clicking another button, so it's not too bad at all. So the first thing that we're going to do is kind of reiterate what we discussed at the end of last lecture. I did it kind of fast. I thought, well, you know what? I really want to make sure that this is clear to you guys because when you guys are writing code, for instance, you guys go to the debug menu, and that's how you usually kind of figure out what's going wrong with your code. In Abacus, this is how you figure out what's going wrong with your simulation. So I'm going to talk about a nonlinear multi-step analysis. 
So first question is, well, what is this really? Well, when we solve these nonlinear problems in Abacus, what Abacus does, or ANSI or whatever FE program you're doing, is it's taking your applied force or displacement, and then it splits it into a number of steps. Very rarely does it go right from zero load to 100% of the load. What usually happens is it splits it up into little steps. So let's say that this is our graph right here of our load displacement response. And let's say that I apply a load F to it, and I want to try and figure out what is going to be the displacement at F. Well, what usually happens is our F3 program doesn't just go from zero load all the way to F in one step. What it does is it does it in a series of increments. So instead of going right from zero to F, it'll go from zero to increment one, and then from increment one to increment two, increment two to increment three, and then increment three all the way up to F. Now, I just did it as three increments here. I guess it'd be technically four because that fourth increment would be getting to F. But usually this is split into hundreds, if not thousands, of increments. It doesn't just go right to F right away. Now, the size of the increment can actually be specified. And that's kind of the goal and why I'm showing you guys these slides, is I want to show you guys how Abacus, or how in Abacus, we can actually specify these increment sizes. Now, to go from increment 2 to increment 3, or basically to go from one increment to another, what actually happens is the newton raphson method is used. So this is why we learned the newton raphson method, because between these increments, this is how we're using to go from one increment to the next. So if I'm looking at increment 2 and increment 3 here, in order to get there, what I would do is I would do the newton raphson method. So in this case, as we can see between those increments, we have those newton raphson iterations all the way to try and get there. So that's, does that make sense to you guys? Ho hopefully that's uh, making more sense now. Now, what also happens is each successful increment is going to be used as the next starting point. So when I go from increment, or basically when I go from zero to increment one, when I go to increment two now, I'm not starting from zero anymore. I'm starting from increment two. And that way we can slowly get there. And I'm hoping that this makes sense to you guys and why Abacus or any other fine element program is doing this, because we think of our assignment. I got a lot of questions, or not, not a lot, but I got a lot of students asking me, saying, Clayton, I'm pretty sure my code is right, but I'm not getting any sort of convergence. And the thing was, your code was correct. Every student, their code was correct. The initial guess was just too far off. So this is why we do this in these incrementations. If I'm trying to go a large distance with this newton raphson method, the chances of it converging are actually very small. So what we do is we break it up into little pieces so that we can slowly get to our desired load of f. If not, it will probably not converge. Now the thing is, even though we had a wrong initial guess and it diverged, that doesn't mean that there is not a solution. As we know, there, there was a solution. So when things diverge and the newton raphson method fails, we can't just have our program saying, you know what, there is no solution, we quit. So that's one of the things we're going to talk about later is, what does Abacus do when the newton raphson method diverges or it reports that there is no solution? So what happens in these programs is we actually decrease the increment size. Let's say I'm trying to go from increment 2 over to increment 3, and I'm at 10 iterations of the newton raphson method, and we still can't find anything. Well, what happens in that very specific case is Abacus just said it diverged. Unsuccessful, basically, is what it says. So what it does is it restarts back at increment 2, and instead of going all the way to increment 3, maybe it'll go somewhere halfway between, trying to get even a smaller approach. So that's what's going on with these finite element software. Now what happens is, is at these increments, this is when things are going to be recorded. As you guys remember, perhaps in the last... Uh, kind of example we did, and I'll show you guys this more again today. Every successful increment that we have, Abacus actually stores that in our results. So what's going to happen is if this was our curve and we solved for these increments, Abacus will report our solution as kind of a dashed line. Now what it does is it takes two increments and it assumes a linear behavior between them. So this is going to be one of the things that you guys want to play with. Because if we were to look at this incrementation right here, Again, Abacus will assume, okay, I solved for this, I solved for this, and it's going to be linear in between. But as we know, the actual curve is a little bit higher than that linear behavior. So if this is important to you guys, you guys are going to want to tell Abacus, hey, 
I want a lot more of these increment points so that I can better capture this curve. So does that make sense to you guys a little bit, what's going on in Abacus? I'm curious, because I didn't explain this very well last time, and I thought I need to give it another shot. So do you guys feel good about why we use that newton raphson method now? Or is it still confusing? I got a yes. Perfect, I got a yes. That's all that matters. All right, good. So now let's talk about how we actually do these incrementations in Abacus. So we can actually specify these incrementations in the second tab of our step module. So all of these incrementations are actually going to be controlled in the step module. Now in the first tab here, if we were to keep it in basic, one of the things that Abacus says is what is going to be the time period? Now this time is a fake time. It's not an actual time period. We're not dealing with the dynamic analysis yet. What this fake time period is used for in these programs is just to track things. If I were to take this clicker right here and extend it to the point where there's some plastic strains and then let go, we have to make sure that, hey, there's plastic strains now on this clicker. This is why we use the time period. It's basically to ensure that we keep track of what has actually happened to our object. Now, by default, Abacus will set this pseudo time period as one, which is great because what this basically means is that these increments that we're going to talk about here, they're basically going to act as percentages of our applied load. So let's just go through this menu really quick. The first one is our maximum number of increments. Now this isn't going to be a big problem, but it'll sometimes happen where you guys will have your analysis abort and you guys are going to say, well, it was a pretty nice analysis. It wasn't very uh, nonlinear. <laughs> non -linear. What's the problem? Well, this could be the problem right here. So what happens is if Abacus is going through these increments and it reaches that maximum number of increments, say 100, it's going to automatically quit, even if it could go further. So this is one of the things to watch out for. Usually if you guys are doing an analysis and you guys know that there's going to be a lot of incrementation, you guys have to increase this number of increment size. Does that make sense to you guys? If not, Abacus will automatically abort the analysis, even though there is still room to go. So that's the first one. The second one is this initial increment size. So by default, Abacus will have it as one. Abacus doesn't know in the beginning if you're doing a linear or nonlinear analysis. If this was a linear analysis, remember, all we're doing is solving the equation k times u equals to f. That's all we're doing in a linear analysis. So going from 0 to 1, or basically from 0 all the way to 100%, that's perfectly fine in a linear analysis. However, in a nonlinear analysis, as we know, it's probably a good idea to have those increments. So what we usually do for this initial increment is we set it to 10%, depending on your problem. If it's an average problem, we set it to 10% or 0 0.1. All right, that's what we do. If it's a highly nonlinear problem, we will probably even decrease it further, maybe to 1%, something like that. So that's going to be basically just the initial increment that Abacus does. After that, we have the minimum increment size. So as I said, if Abacus is doing those increments and it diverges, what it does is it goes back to the last successful increment and then it, incre uh, sorry, it decreases that increment size. That makes it smaller. Now what happens is if there's going to be a point where if it gets too small or it's smaller than this limit, Abacus is automatically going to just abort and say, you know what? The increment size that we need to complete this is smaller than the requested minimum. So if you guys are dealing with a nonlinear problem or a highly nonlinear problem, you guys are going to want to decrease this a lot. Typically what happens in things like concrete when we have cracking. So keep in mind that cracking goes up elastically and then it suddenly drops, right? Because it cracks. It's very brittle. That is highly nonlinear. And from my personal experience, those step sizes for those can go up to 10 to the negative 15 very, very small increment sizes. Now what happens in Abacus is if I had it left as 1 times 10 to the negative 5, Abacus is just going to abort. Even though it can find the solution, it's just going to abort. So this is another one of those things that we're going to have to keep in mind. And finally, the last one is the maximum increment size. Now this is kind of a, a funny one. We typically only use this to make sure that we get results. So what happens is if Abacus diverges, it decreases the increment size. However, what happens is if Abacus consistently is able to achieve convergence, so let's say it tries 10%, good to go, 20%, good to go, 30%, good to go, Abacus will say, hey, 
I'm doing all these increments, everything's working out great. Instead of taking steps of 10%, let's go 20%. Now, the thing is, is if we go 20%, that point in between, that 10% in between, Abacus no longer records that. So what usually we do is we specify this maximum to make sure that Abacus is recording those points. So if I were to go back here, remember we said that this right here could be a problem. What I would do is I would specify a maximum increment size so that Abacus would do another point, let's say somewhere in here, even though it is able to go from basically, let's say 60% all the way to 100%. If we were to specify a maximum increment size of 10%, then we'd have a point here at 70, a point here at 80, and then a point here at 90%. But there's other ways in making sure that Abacus is able to specify whatever kind of loading that you guys want. So those are kind of the big three here. Now, another thing to keep in mind, as I was just saying, is Abacus records each successful increment. So every increment that is successful, Abacus will actually present you guys in your results, which is great because instead of just seeing our beam go from zero deflection all the way to our final deflection, what we can see is we can see each increment and our beam slowly going down, which is also nice because we can start to see at what lows does our beam actually start to fail, whether it be yielding, uh, cracking of the concrete, crushing of the concrete, stuff like that. Now, after the initial increment, so if we look here, we have an initial increment, and then we have basically a maximum minimum increment. We don't actually specify what's happening in between. So what Abacus does in between, I've kind of already talked about this, is it has basically an automatic solver. So what's going to say is if I'm doing, let's say, three increments and there's no problem, Abacus is automatically going to increase that increment size or vice versa. If I have an increment and Abacus diverges, then it's automatically going to decrease the increment size to try and optimize this step time. We don't want to be around here forever, basically. If I were to specify my initial increment as 1%, but there is no problem doing 10%, well, my program is going to take longer to run because it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, instead of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. So this is why Abacus has this nice solver. Now, if you guys are saying, you know what, Clayton, I prefer just going 1, 2, 3, 4 in a nice consistent manner. What we could do right here is we can click fixed. So instead of going automatic, we can go fixed. And if that's the case, then you guys can specify that increment size and Abacus will always stick to it. However, this is typically a problem because, like I said, once we start getting into the nonlinearities, that increment size might actually need to drop. And if we're specifying an increment size and it needs to drop, well, then Abacus is just going to abort. So usually we like to go to this automatic increment size so that once the nonlinearities are present, Abacus is able to handle it. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of incrementation. So these are going to be something that we specify. Now, I kind of mentioned that we can use these increment sizes and stuff like this. Initial equals one. OK, so I got a message about this. This right here is going to be basically the amount of time. So what happens in Abacus in this basic menu is it's going to say, what is the going to be your fake time period? And by default, it's set to one. So usually what we want to do is we want to go from zero all the way to one. So if this initial increment right here is equal to one, what it basically means is it's going from 0 to 100%. So basically, it tries to do everything in one increment. Now, what we can do is we can set this to any number basically divided by 100 of a percent. So let's say that I wanted to apply 10% of my load in increments. I would change this to 0 0.1. If I wanted 1%, I would change this to 0 0.01. Does that make sense now, hopefully? It makes sense. Perfect. So this is something that we are going to cover a lot when we do the examples today. Again, today's theory is actually going to be pretty light. We're going to get into two Abacus examples, and it'll make sense to you guys. So as I was saying, that debug menu that we use in coding helps us figure out what exactly is going wrong. Well, in Abacus, we can use these increments to do the exact same thing. So after we submit our job and before we click results, we can also click a different button called Monitor. So this is in the job menu. So remember, when we'd right click, we'd go submit, and then we'd right click and go results. Well, we can also right click and go monitor. And then this menu will appear right here. And this has all the information that we need concerning the solving of our system. So the first one is going to be the step. So 
up until this point, we've always dealt with just one step. But if we had multiple steps, let's say that I wanted to compress my wall, that'd be one step. And then I wanted to load my wall laterally, that'd be a second step. So the first column here is just what step is basically happening. The second column here is the increment. So basically what increment number we are going to. So notice that the first one right there, for the first two rows, it says one and then one. It didn't go from one to two, it went from one to one. Well, the reason why is this. This third column right here, this is the attempt. So as we can see in the first row there, it says one U, which basically means it attempted increment one, but it was actually unsuccessful. It was unsuccessful. So what it did is it actually lowered the step size and then in our second increment there, or a second attempt, then it was successful. So this is gonna be kind of your worst nightmare right here. Once you see those U's, that means that things are diverging. So this is where you got to watch out. So you right there, that means unsuccessful. It diverged. Now what happens in Abacus, because we got to keep in mind that even though we can control these step sizes, there's going to be a point in our models where things actually diverge. Let's say that every material in the model fails completely. It diverges. So what happens is Abacus has to pick up when that divergence actually happens. So what happens in Abacus is this. If it's unsuccessful five times in a row, five times in a row, then it aborts the analysis. Then it says, you know what? It diverged. Nothing I can do about it. So that's going to be kind of your indicator that, hey, something happened. It diverged. Abacus failed. Now, I'm going to tell you guys a little secret here. There is a way to switch that five unsuccessful attempts to whatever you want. <laughs> and I'll show you guys why that's important later. But for now, by default, all, all the Abacus programs that you guys have, by default, it's going to be five unsuccessful increments. It aborts the analysis. But as we can see here, after that first unsuccessful increment, it was able to be successful in the next increment. So the next column right here, these total iterations, these are the amount of Newton rafts and iterations between each increment. So it's kind of something nice to see. Usually what happens is Abacus wants this around five or six, five or six. That's usually deemed as good. What happens is if it goes to 10, Abacus is saying, you know what, this, this is taking a little while. I might want to decrease my increment size. Or if it's able to achieve it in, let's say, two iterations, then Abacus is saying, well, you know what, I can probably increase my increment size. So that's going to be the total amount of newton rafts and iterations. The next one right here is going to be our total time. So remember, in Abacus, by default, our time is set to 1. And our step size is basically going up with that time until we reach one. So what happened in this analysis is we started at zero and then we went from 0 0.0025 and then 0 0.005, etc. So once this rate here reaches one, then our analysis is actually done. And what happens here is this is a percentage of how much load is actually going to be applied. And we'll talk about that in a second here. Now, the last thing right here is going to be our increments. So these aren't just the total time. So if we look right here, this is going to be the 0 0.0025 plus 0 0.0025. This gives me the 0 0.05. So this is going to be our total time, but this is going to be that increment time, how much we were able to go up without actually diverging. So as we can see here, we tried 0 0.01. It was unsuccessful. Abacus went down to 0 0.0025. This one was successful. So it stayed there. And then after this, it was able to achieve it twice in a row. Then it increased it to 0 0.00375. Now, we're actually going to talk about this. So if we look at our first increment here, our increment size was 0 0.01, which basically means 1% of our applied load or displacement. If I were to apply 100 kilonewtons, a step size of 0 0.01 is going to simply be 1 kilonewton. If I were to apply 100 millimeters of deflection, a step size of 0 0.01 is simply going to be one millimeter of deflection. Now, when I ran this, as we can see, this was unsuccessful. Abacus said it diverged. I can't handle 1% of this load. What do we do? Well, we actually decreased that step size. So instead of going 1%, we decreased it to 0.25% of our applied load. And as we can see here in this attempt, since it doesn't have a U, it was actually successful. It was saying, you know what, this is good to go. So in the next step, it stayed with that same time step that it was able to be successful at. So in the third increment, it kept it at that 0 0.0025, and it was successful again. Then Abacus said, you know what? 
it was successful twice in a row. Let's try and increase it. So Abacus increased it to 0 0.00375. It was also good to go. That's kind of what happens with Abacus. So hopefully the process makes sense to you guys. Now, last thing we're going to talk about is this. And I expect that you guys are experts. So if we apply a load to our model, it's called load control. Makes sense, right? We apply a load, it's called load control. Now, if we apply a displacement, it's called displacement control. Now, quick question for you guys in the chat. Which one do you guys think is better? And I'm using that in quotation because, of course, it depends on the purpose. But if you guys had a choice, which one would you guys pick? Load control or displacement control? I'm curious to know your thoughts. What sits better with you guys, load control or displacement control? All right, I got a private message saying displacement control. Anyone else? Any brave souls out there? Displacement? All right, I got two displacements, so we'll just say that the general consens consensus of the chat is displacement. So, oh, I do have one load control. All right, so we're kind of split. So let's talk about what exactly each one does. So let's say that this is our curve right here. Now let's say that I want to apply load control. So I'm applying my load F to our model. What happens is, of course, we go through all the increments. So let's say this is our first increment. This is our second increment, third, fourth, fifth increment. And we can see by the fifth increment, we get that peak load, right? So, so far, we're good to go. What happens when we go to the next increment? What's going to happen when I try and apply that increment to Abacus or ANSYS or whatever you guys want? Is Abacus or ANSYS or whatever you're using, is that going to be successful in determining that last increment? I got a private message saying no, fail, exactly. So what happens is, is load control is a problem in the sense that we're increasing that load, but there's going to get to a point where our load is going to be higher than the peak load and Abacus is going to diverge. Now, why is this a problem? Well, if we look at our model here, we are able to capture this point, this point, this point, this point, and even peak load. But how do we capture this area over here, the softening? We can't. So for load control, we're capable of finding things like the peak load. But if any softening effects are important to us, we actually can't capture it using load control. Because again, we're just increasing that load. Now, if we were to go to displacement control, now instead of going up with force, we are going across with displacement. We say, all right, there's increment one, two, three, four, five. So just like load control, we're still able to capture that peak load. But then we're able to go, oh, six, that's good to go, seven, and we can go on and on and on. So for displacement control, we're able to capture the peak load as well as the softening behavior. So this actually makes it a preferred choice if applicable. However, we have to keep in mind that not all scenarios we can actually throw in displacement control. Of course, it's, it's great, but sometimes we have things like P-delta effects. Well, if I'm increasing, let's say, an eccentricity, I can't really do that in displacement control. So my question to you guys is, is there a way that we can capture softening effects in load control? What do you guys think? Can we capture softening effects in load control? What do you guys think? Any brave takers? No? No one? So I got a private message, and this is a good one. So it says, after we reach this final load, why not just start to decrease it? Well, what's going to happen is if we start to decrease it, we're going to go back to this solution, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. So there actually is a way to capture these softening effects using load control. And this will be discussed in our last lecture, so lecture number 10. As you guys remember, when we're picking our step in Abacus, 
there was two types of static. The first one was static general, which is what the one we're using all the time. But then there was a second one called static ricks. And that's what we're going to be using if we want to use load control, but still capture these effects. And it's actually going to be on your assignment, in your last assignment. So be ready for that. It's actually a very beautiful method. It's called the arc length method. So can we define the stress and the strain? Well, of course you can define it, but again, it's just going to go back the other way. In Abacus or ANSI's mind, when you do in the solver, it's going to go back. Keep in mind that we, the solver is just a solver. It doesn't know, hey, this guy wants to keep going forward. It doesn't know that. So that's what usually happens. But again, we'll discuss a way and how we can actually incorporate it later on. Sound good? So that's going to be the first kind of little subtopic. Now we're going to hit on the main topic, which is isotropic hardening. And this is when we're going to start to input that plasticity into abacus. All right, plasticity into abacus. So again, we'll discuss kinematic hardening at the end for a bit. It mainly just has to do with the Boeschinger effect. Nothing too special. So metal behavior or isotropic hardening. I don't want to say metal behavior in general because as you guys have seen in Abacus, there are many different ways to define plasticity, things like that. So we're going to be focusing on isotropic hardening. So as a civil engineer, this is all you guys really need to know. If you guys are a mechanical engineer, well, I don't really know what you guys do. <laughs> so I'm not sure if this will be enough for you guys. Well, actually, who was it that said kinematic hardening? Was it Ammer? I'm, I'm not sure who it was. But whoever is the Mechi engineer that said kinematic hardening, when would you use kinematic hardening? That's my question. I'm actually kind of curious. Oh, it's sorry. Sorry, Ammer. It was Aslam. So when, when do you use kinematic hardening rather than isotropic hardening? For steel? All the time? I guess you could, it would be more of a fatigue, would it not? Okay. Okay, no, that, that makes sense. Again, I was just curious. Perfect. So again, I'll show you guys what kinematic hardening is, but you don't have to worry about it too much. So to determine the behavior of a metal, a metal, not medical, <laughs> a metal, what we usually do is we take our metal, we go to the structural lab, we tell the lab techs that we want to test the metal. They usually swear at us for a little bit. And then we obtain the engineering stress slash engineering strain relationship. So let's say that I took a piece of rebar and we get this right here. We get kind of this behavior right here. Now, the thing to keep in mind is this is going to be our engineering stress and our engineering strain. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Now, the thing that we have to keep in mind is there's going to be a lot of points of interest in this little behavior here. The first one right here is point A, and we call this our proportionality limit. So this is where the curve starts becoming that perfectly linear curve. All right, this is called our proportionality limit. We've, up until this point, our stress is equal to our Young's modulus times the strain, nice and simple. Now, a little bit further past this is our elastic limit. So this is kind of one of those things that we typically neglect because they're very close together. But even after the proportionality ends, so even when it becomes a little bit nonlinear, metal actually typically remains elastic for a little bit, a little bit, even though it's nonlinear. So we have a proportionality limit, and then we also have an elastic limit. Now, what happens after we hit this elastic limit for a little bit is we have yielding. So as we can see here, under a constant stress, we're still experiencing that deformation. The strain is still increasing. But after that, we hit a point called strain hardening. So as we can see, the stress starts to increase, but this is over a very large amount of strain, a very large amount of strain. Now, after it hits what we say is the ultimate stress, the stress required to strain the object starts to decrease, and we call this necking. And then this ultimately leads to failure. Now, two important points here is we have point D here. And the stress at point D is what we call the ultimate stress. Okay, this is called the ultimate stress. The stress required at point E is called the failure stress. So there's kind of two different stresses here. Now, here's where things get interesting. If I were to load up until this green star right here, I take my metal and I load up until this green star. 
and I unload it. It's going to go back to zero strain, meaning that all of the strain was fully recoverable. If I were to take the clicker, I stretch it, it's still elastic and I let go, it's going to go back to its original position, no harm done. However, what happens when we get to this point over here? If I were to keep pulling this clicker until it hits strain hardening and it's kind of going up that curve and I were to unload it, is it going to go back to zero strain? What do you guys think? Is it going to go back to zero strain? If I were to stretch it to this green point right here and then unload it. No, exactly. If I were to unload it, it's going to follow kind of a same nice linear behavior and it's going to hit this point right here. Now we say that the difference between zero strain and the point it's currently at is a permanent strain, or as we're going to call it in abacus, this is going to be our plastic strain. Okay, this is going to be our plastic strain. Now, it looks like it's going to be a real pain in the ass, but we have one thing going for us in metals. One very, very beautiful thing, and that is this. The slope of the unloading curve, whether you're in the plastic zone or in the elastic zone, is always going to be the same. So if I were to know that stress at that point, and I were to know the slope at which it decreases, I can very easily find the intercept in that strain curve. It's not going to be a challenge at all. But we still have to ask ourselves, well, how do we model this? Now, think from an abacus perspective, okay? You guys kind of know abacus a little bit now. If I were to model this behavior right here, and this is all I was concerned about was this elastic region, how would you model this in abacus? What do you guys think? Can you guys input elastic material properties into abacus? Yes, it's something that we've did for the last couple of assignments now. Elastic properties in Abacus, that's no big deal. You need the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio, piece of cake. How about this region over here? Do you guys know how to import that bad boy into Abacus? I'm curious because I think a lot of you guys have used Abacus before this class. So I want to see how many actually know. How many of you guys can throw that bad boy into Abacus? All right, it's a little bit silent, so that's okay. That's what I'm here to teach you. Tabular values, yeah, that's exactly where we're headed. Now, I got a question for those of you who didn't. Do you think that that right there is going to be easy or difficult? I'm very curious. We're dealing with plasticity now, guys. This is the, this is the big leagues. Is it? Do you think it's going to be difficult or do you think it's going to be rather simple? Yes, we'll need, let's say that we have all the experimental data, though. We have our engineering stress, our engineering strain curve. We go to the lab, that's already done. If we have this curve, and I want to throw that bad boy in Abacus, you think it's going to be difficult? Maybe a little bit indecisive. It's actually really simple. And this is kind of the good thing that we have for us. Yeah, if we have the data, it's going to be nice and simple. So we're going to discuss Abacus isotropic hardening. All right, so all we have to do to define this isotropic hardening is inner material behavior, where you guys usually click elasticity and then elastic. All we have to do is go plasticity and then plastic. It sounds really simple, right? You guys know how to do elastic. All you have to do is instead of going elastic, you have to go plastic. But keep in mind that when we're dealing these analysis, we have to actually have both. We have to have the elastic and the plastic portion. You can't just have plastic. Now, when you guys click this, you guys are given this menu right here. Okay, this is the menu that's going to appear under plastic. It's going to say two columns. First one is yield stress, and then the second one is plastic strain. Yield stress and plastic strain. So this is all we're going to need to define in Abacus. Yield stress plastic strain. I'm going to keep saying it so you guys remember it. Now, here's where it gets a little bit funky. This table right here is actually, like someone pointed out, it's a table. And it's kind of misleading. And this is the problem for us as civil engineers. I think in civil engineering, we don't discuss cyclic behavior enough. We, we don't. 
When you guys think of yield stress in civil engineering, typically we think of one value. Uh, the stress of a rebar, it yields at 400 MPa. The stress of that steel beam, that yields is 350 MPa. We always associate yield stress with one singular value, but it's actually not. And this is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So what happens is, is as the material begins to experience strain hardening, the yield stress actually change. So this is one thing, again, we're going to talk about. But I want you guys, my civil engineers out there, I think my mechie guys are probably saying, oh yeah, Clayton, I already know this. But for my civvies, we have to keep in mind that when we do strain hardening, the yield stress is going to change. And this is why this is actually a table rather than just one entry. Usually a lot of civil engineers will say, all right, my yield stress is 400 MPa and my plastic strain is whatever. And then they kind of leave it and you say, oh, no, no, we actually have to go on. So what this table actually is, is this is a bunch of points on our strain hardening curve. And we're going to discuss again what those actually are. Now, the plastic strain portion, this is something we already talked about. As we start to experience strain hardening, that permanent strain at the bottom starts to increase. So that's what that column is going to be. Now, again, if you guys are confused, don't worry. We're going to discuss what exactly this is. And we're actually going to do a little example here in the lecture slides, as well as an abacus to really help you guys understand. So the first thing that we want is the true stress and the true strain. So this is typically a problem and a lot of people ignore it because if you were to go to the lab and you guys were to say, well, actually, how many of you guys have been in the structural lab? You guys been in the structural lab? You guys talked to Greg and Cam? Maybe not. <laughs> I guess it's closed down right now a little bit. All right. So when you go to the lab and you test your specimen, so let's say that this pencil right here is my piece of steel rebar. Now I were to pull it, I get a nice graph from the lab. Now in the lab, that graph is our engineering strain, engineering stress curve. However, when we're inputting these points, oh, my audio is cutting out. Is it better now? Hopefully it's better. Yes? Okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll start over. Don't worry. This is the, the one kind of thing that sucks about online learning. <laughs> if I was there right now, I wouldn't be cutting out. All right. So when we go to the lab and we test the specimen, we always get the engineering strain, engineering stress relationship. All right. The engineering strain, engineering stress. However, when we input these points into Abacus, we want it in terms of the true strain and the true stress. So the first step that we're always going to do with our lab data is find the true stress, true strain relationship. Now, what's the difference between them? Who can answer me that? What's the difference between true stress and engineering stress? Area. That's a broad answer, but it is still correct. <laughs> so the engineering stress and strain is based on the original cross-section area. So if I were to go to the lab and I were to measure this really quick, let's say that this is 10 millimeters. As I'm pulling it, I will always use that 10 millimeters as my area. But we know that once I start pulling this due to Poisson's effects, that area is actually going to start to shrink. So the true stress and strain is based on that deformed cross-sectional area. So Nathan pointed out a very nice equation, and we're going to derive it right here. True stress is equal to engineering stress multiplied by 1 plus the engineering strain. And we're going to derive that here on this slide. But we have to keep one thing in mind, or one assumption, to allow us to derive that. So Nathan, do you know what that assumption is? Maybe not. That's OK. That's OK. So to actually create that equation, we have to find a relationship between the original cross-sectional area and the deformed cross-sectional area. How do we do that? Well, we assume that the volume of our bar or whatever we're testing, it remains constant. Now, for metals, this is perfectly fine. A lot of experimental data has shown that this is actually a very reasonable assumption. So this is a kind of experimentally backed. So let's say that we have our bar right here. It has an original length L and a cross-sectional area A0. So this is, again, its original length. And then I were to pull this bad boy. So now that cross-sectional area has decreased and then becomes A, 
and then the length has increased, becomes L. Now, since we're assuming that constant volume, we can have this relationship right here, where L0 times A0 is equal to L times A. So the original length times the original area is now equal to the current length times the current area. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to modify that a little bit so that we have an equation for basically our current deformed area. So if we were to go back and look at this and say, all right, well, if I want the engineering stress, engineering stress, well, this is based on the original cross-sectional area. So we take our force, the thing that we're pulling it by, and we simply divide it by A0. And this is nice and simple because the force, that's something given right in the lab. The original area, well, we know that. Piece of cake. Now, the original engineering strain is simply L minus L0 divided by L0. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to modify this equation to L over L0 minus 1. And the reason why I'm going to do this is going to be very clear moving forward. Now, if we were to look at this equation and we were to look at our current area equation, both terms have this L naught divided by L, or one that I guess is just kind of upside down. So what I can do is I can modify our area equation to this, where our current area is equal to our original area divided by 1 plus our engineering strain. 1 plus our engineering strain. And this is the equation we are going to now use to define our true stresses and our true strains. So our true stress has a very similar formula, but again, instead of taking that original cross-sectional area A0, we are now dividing it by our new area A. But it's nice because if we look up kind of above there, we have a nice equation for our area. So we can actually write this as follows, where our true stress is equal to F divided by A0, multiplied by 1 plus our engineering strain. Now, if we were to look at this F divided by A0, well, that's simply our engineering stress. So our true stress is equal to our engineering stress multiplied by 1 plus our engineering strain. Nice and simple. Now, our true strain, our true strain, is can be expressed as the natural logarithm of L divided by L0. This comes from an integral. Okay, this comes from an integral. Again, the theory you don't really need to know. Now, if we look at that L divided by L0, well, we know we have a nice relationship between L divided by L0 and our engineering strain. So our true strain is simply going to be the natural logarithm of 1 plus our engineering strain. So if I were to go to the lab and get my engineering stress, my engineering strain curve, if I wanted to find the true stress and the true strain, it's actually not a problem. We have nice equations for it right here. Piece of cake. Now, this is kind of the first part that we need when we start to input things into Abacus, but we have to talk about that yield stress and that plastic strain. So what we do in the theory of plasticity is we say that our total strain, which would be in this case our true strain, it actually has two portions. First, we have an elastic strain component, which we call epsilon E, and then we have a plastic strain component, which we call epsilon P. Nice and simple, makes sense, right? And the relationship between the two is actually very simple where our total strain, or in this case our true strain, it's simply going to be our elastic strain plus our plastic strain. It's simply going to be those two added together. Makes sense. Our total strain is going to be our elastic component plus our plastic component. So let's say at this point we took our lab data and we found a nice true stress, true strain curve. And we say, all right, well, from our lab data, we can say that the original yielding point is probably somewhere right here. Now, if I were to unload at this point right here, let's say I loaded it up to the blue point and then I unloaded it, it would kind of follow that blue dashed line. So at this point, I'm going to ask you guys, what is our plastic strain component? What is going to be our plastic strain component for that point right there? I got a lot of direct messages and normal messages saying zero. You guys are completely correct. It'd be absolutely zero because it goes back down to zero. So what we'd say is this right here is going to be our elastic strain. And in this region right here, our true strain is simply our elastic strain. Nice and simple. Now let's look at a different point right here. This purple point. If I were to unload it, remember it follows the same unloading slope as our elastic point. We would get kind of this relationship here. So this point right here, this would be our true strain or our total strain. So in this particular case, is our plastic strain going to be equal to zero? What do you guys think? Plastic strain for this purple bad boy, is that going to be equal to zero? I got a direct message saying no. 
completely correct. So this part right here, we say that this is the elastic strain, because usually what happens is, is when we unload, we end up here, but then we can unload here and we can keep going back and forth. So this strain right here is our new elastic strain, because we can keep recovering it if we keep loading cyclically. However, this portion over here, we say that this is going to be our plastic strain, because at this point right here, we can never recover this plastic strain. Now, another thing that happens is this, and I kind of hinted to this when I was just saying, we can keep loading cyclically, elastically, now up until this point. So what happens to my uh, metal is once I load it up until this point, this point right here actually becomes our new yield stress. Our new yield stress. So this is why Abacus actually has tabular values of this yield stress, is because if I wanted to input this point and this point, they actually have different yield stresses. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now, it makes sense to you guys, maybe we have that new yield stress, but how do we figure out that plastic strain? Remember, that's what I want to input into Abacus. I don't want to input the true stress. I don't want to input the elastic stress. I want the plastic, not stress, <laughs> strain. I want the plastic strain component. So to figure that out, I'm just going to take that equation above and I'm going to rearrange it for the plastic strain. So we know it's going to be equal to the true strain minus that elastic strain. Now the true strain, remember, that's something that we get basically from the lab. We find it in the lab, we convert it to true strain, we're good to go. Question becomes, what is that elastic strain? Well, again, if I were to know what my stress is at this point, as well as my unloading slope, which is going to be the Young's modulus, well, then this elastic strain is simply going to be sigma divided by E. Now, this is the formula we're going to be using when we want to put these things into Abacus. So if we want to import this, or not import, <laughs> input this purple point into Abacus, all we need to do is simply enter the new yield stress along with this plastic strain calculated from this above. And we can repeat this for as many points as we want. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, why do I need to keep going? How, why do I have to put lots of points? Well, what you're going to do in Abacus when you're importing these two points, so let's say in Abacus I put in this point right here, and then I put this point right here, so I have two points. What Abacus is going to do by default is it's going to assume a linear relationship between those two points. So although a curve is curved between these two points, realistically, Abacus is going to assume it's going to be this. So if you guys are saying, well, you know what? This point over here is very important to me. I really need this point. You guys need to include another point over here. Now, kind of a funny question for you guys. If I were to have a point over here that's linear, so this from this point over to this point is linear, I want you guys to understand that I don't really need this middle point because again, Abacus is going to assume a nice linear relationship. The best point would actually be right here. If I wanted to put another point over here, then I don't need a bunch of points in this region because it's almost linear. The more points you have, the more computation time you're going to use. So you want to try and find a balance where you can model this curve with as few points as possible. It'll increase your runtime, increase your efficiency, everything like that. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. And if it doesn't, well, we have a nice example. And hopefully this will make sense to you guys. So if we were to look at this, let's say we go to the lab. We say, hey, Greg, hey, Cam, I got this rebar. Want to test it. Again, they'll probably swear at you a little bit. But at the end of the day, you have your test done. You have your engineering stress, your engineering strain. As well as from the data, you can figure out the Young's modulus and the yield strength. Nice and simple. Right? Nice and simple. Well, dealing with the lab text is never simple, but this part right here is nice and simple. So if we look at this, you're saying, all right, I have my behavior, but now I want to try and model this in Abacus. All right, I want to try and model this in Abacus. Well, the first thing that we said that we need is going to be our true stress and our true strain. Now, if we were to look at this, you're saying, well, Clayton, this is no problem at all. We have nice formulas for true stress and true strain. If I were to look at my engineering strain of 0.001 and engineering stress of 200, I just throw those into my formulas and I can get my true stress and my true strain values. Now, question for you guys. If my yield stress right here is 400 and my true stress is 200, what's going to be my plastic strain for this portion right here? What's going to be my plastic strain for this first row? You guys are so smart. I love it. 
it's going to be zero because our stress right now didn't cause any yielding. We're still elastic at this point. Now moving on to the next column, you say, all right, oh, I got an engineering strain of 0 0.002, engineering stress of 400. Well, I just throw those into my equations. I get my new engineering strain. Uh, sorry, I get my true stress and my true strain. And again, my plastic strain is going to be essentially zero. It's going to be essentially zero. I know you guys are saying, well, we have that 0.8, Clayton. Well, don't worry. It's basically going to be zero. That's another thing I, I find with a lot of students is they're very fixed on decimal places in Abacus. You guys don't need a lot of decimal places. Abacus is <laughs> its not going to make a big difference on your guys' results. So now you guys are saying, well, Clayton, you're not showing any sample calculations. Well, that's because for the first two rows, the plastic strain was essentially zero. But now in this third one, we have 500 MPA which we know is going to be yielding at this point. So I'm going to show you guys the sample calculations now. So if I were to say, all right, my engineering strain is 0 0.003, engineering stress is 500. Well, if I want that true strain, I just go to my nice formula, 1 plus my engineering strain, natural logarithm, and I get 0 0.002996. So I can put that in there, and I can do the same thing for my true stress. My true stress is equal to my engineering stress multiplied by 1 by my engineering strain, I get 501.5. Now what's nice here is because like we said, at this point, we know that it's yielding. So we're going to have a plastic strain component. So all we do to find that is we take our true stress, or sorry, our true strain, which we said is that 0 0.002996, and we subtract our stress divided by our Young's modulus. So our true stress at this point is 501.5, and our Young's modulus is 200,000. So at this point, our true strain, or sorry, our plastic strain is 0 0.000488. So that makes sense to you guys? Do you guys know how to find the plastic strain now? What do you guys think? Do you guys know how to find the plastic strain? Is, is it a simple process? Yes, I got it. I got it. Yes, it's it's a direct message you guys haven't seen. It's a nice process. So what we're going to do is we just repeat it for our last two columns. And then we say, all right, well, then I need to throw this into Abacus. Now, remember, Abacus said yield stress and plastic strain. This right here is going to always be our new yield stress. And then we have our plastic strain. So if I want to throw this in Abacus, all I need. To, oh, sorry. This is the graph. All I need to do is throw in these values right here into Abacus. I'm good to go. This will model those points. Now, I want to bring your guys' attention to something kind of very special here, and that is this. Comparing the true stress and the true strain, is there a big difference? What do you guys think? Is, there, is that a big difference? True stress and true strain, is that something that you guys are worried about? As we can see here, for small deformations, so let's say those first two columns, the true stress and the true strain are approximately equal to our engineering stress and our engineering strain. And even at the larger deformations, they're still pretty similar. So this is why you guys didn't see us talking about it in our linear analysis. That's one of the questions I expected you guys to ask me, but no one did. <laughs> you guys are saying, Clayton, well, if this true stress and true strain is the way to go, why didn't we do that in our linear analysis? We never really needed to because as we can see in the linear portion, they're basically the exact same thing. It's only once we start getting into the larger deformation we actually have to account for them. Now, when I import this into Abacus right here for my plasticity, it doesn't give me the whole curve. I'm warning you guys that now. It doesn't give me the whole curve. What these points will actually do is give me this portion up here. How do I get this portion down here? If I were to go to Abacus and I import my plastic parameters, I get this. But how do I get this portion kind of down here? Yes, I got a private message saying define the elasticity. Exactly. So in Abacus, we have to do two things. We define the elastic parameters, and then we define the plastic parameters. But it's going to be as simple as that. Now, kind of a little tip or trick. The first point that we always import is going to be our input is always going to be our current yield stress. So in this case, it'd be around 400 and then zero because our plastic strain always has to start from zero. If you guys put a non-zero plastic strain as your first point, Abacus will not run. It'll give you an error. So make sure that your first point here is zero. 
And then after that, you guys can just keep adding as many points as you want. Here we have three points after our initial yield. You guys can have 20. You guys can have 40. Abacus doesn't really care about how many points you input, but it's going to cost you runtime. So keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that the relationship between these points is going to be linear. So if you have a curve that's very curvy, you guys are going to probably want more points to capture that curve. If you guys have, like, let's say this region right here, I don't really need this middle point because the linear approximation is very close to what it actually is. So you guys don't want a lot of points in your graph. You guys want to make your models run faster. So that's it for the example. Last thing I'm going to talk about, of course, is yielding. Now, this is kind of like a little fun fact. But we said that in Abacus, we define two different things. We define the elastic parameters, which captured the elastic part, and the plastic parameters, which captured the plastic part. But how does Abacus know when to pick which one? How does it know if it's elastic, or how does it know if it's plastic? Remember that when we're inputting our behavior into Abacus, this is what essentially we're putting in. We're inputting a uniaxial behavior, which would be epsilon 1, 1, sigma 1, 1. But in our element, we have a Cauchy stress matrix, a bunch of different stress components. So my question is, is if we have that Cauchy stress matrix, how can we tell if it's yielding? What do you guys think? How can we tell if that's actually yielding? We discussed it before. Oh, you guys are smart. Exactly. The von Mises stress. So what Abacus does is it calculates all the stresses in the element, and then it calculates the von Mises stress. Now, if this von Mises stress is greater than the yield stress, we know it's yielding. If it's less than the yield stress, we say it's not yielding. So you guys notice that once you guys throw your results into Abacus, and you guys first look at your results, by default, Abacus will always give you the von Mises stress first. And this is why. It's a very important measure of stress, because it shows us how much stress in terms of uniaxial stress each element is overgoing. So it's very easy to pinpoint, oh, that region's yielding, that region's not yielding, etc. So that, that's kind of it for the theory today. Is there any questions about the theory? We're going to take a short break after this, and then we're going to get into a nice Abacus example. But before that, is there any theory or... <laughs> Theory? No, questions. <laughs> I couldn't figure out that word. Is there any questions that you guys have? Ooh, good question. Very good question. What happens if we want to define an elastic, perfectly plastic behavior? And this is something I'm going to go over to the little drawing board on because it's hard to describe. So where's my screen share options? So I'm going to actually I'll exit out of the PowerPoint. And no, I, I don't want to stop sharing. I just want to switch the share. But there was problems where if I were to stop this, it stops recording this screen. So let me take my video really quick. Let me pause. So there's no way of switching the recording over to this. But we're going to go really quick and you guys will be able to see here. And this is something we'll talk about a little bit later. So I'm going to share our drawing tablet and this. So can you guys see the drawing tablet really quick? That's a that's a good to go. Is this all right, perfect. So what happens when you guys are importing these points into Abacus? And let's switch colors. We say that we have our yield stress right here. And let's say that we say that this one's going to be sigma y comma zero. And let's say that we import this point over here. So in Abacus, we have this, right? Now what happens is if the stress goes past this point, or sorry, the, the strain, because this is always done in increments of strain, what happens is Abacus will just keep this constant forever. So if you guys wanted that perfectly plastic, all you guys really need to do is put this yield stress, so this would be sigma y and then zero plastic strain, and then Abacus will automatically just keep this as constant forever. So that last point that you guys have, and this is actually something we're going to cover in the example today, that last point that we have, Abacus just extends it horizontally after that. It doesn't automatically start to decrease or anything like that. It just keeps it nice and constant. So does that answer your question? Perfect. Now the last thing I want to talk about, and again, this, this is kind of because I was asked this, and that was about kinematic hardening. 
So what happens in this isotropic hardening is this, and this is what you guys will have in Abacus by default. And this this is kind of just for your own benefit. So if this is not recorded, who cares? This is just fun facts, if you will. So what happens is if I were to, let's say, go up to my yield stress, and then I were to keep going up to this point right here, and then I were to unload it, unload it cyclically. What happens is this will come down, say, to this point right here. Now for this isotropic hardening, isotropic hardening, this right here is our new yield stress. As we said, this is going to be sigma y. And this right here will be sigma y as well. So for isotropic hardening, my yield stress in tension is going to be my yield stress and compression and vice versa. They're not going to change. So this is isotropic hardening. This is what we covered just now. Now in Abacus, what we can also do is called kinematic hardening. So if I were to do the exact same thing and say, you know what, I'm loading, I go past my yield stress and I go to, let's say this point right here. So now this point is my new yield stress, sigma y. In kinematic hardening, once I start to unload it, it'll stop right here. So this yield stress in the other direction is actually going to be less than, so I'll call this yield stress 2. This one's going to be less than my current yield stress. So that's kinematic hardening. Now in Abacus, all we need to do is we need to click a button that says kinematic hardening. Now how do we account for that mathematically? Well, we have something called the back stress. And the back stress is kind of a curve that looks like this. And what this curve does is it defines kind of the midway point. So the distance from this point down to here. So the distance there, that's going to be equal from the distance down to here. Now, I didn't draw it to scale at all, but that's all we basically do. It's essentially isotropic hardening, but we take into account the fact that our yield surface changes. Our yield surface changes. <laughs> it, oh, it's, it's really hard to describe without getting into solid mechanics. That's kinematic hardening. If you guys know what it is, that's all I really care about. Again, you guys aren't going to be tested on kinematic hardening. Does that answer your question for those of you who are asking about kinematic hardening at all? <laughs> Probably not. Again, that's something I can't really discuss until I start talking about failure surfaces. Bon oh, yeah, no. It'll just get really messy. <laughs> I'll show you where the option is in Abacus, and that's all we're going to do. So that's it for the theory. Again, we are going to come back after the break and do a nice Abacus example. And it shouldn't take us that long. We might even uh, get out early today, guys and girls. <laughs> all right, so let's take a bit of a longer break because then we'll just do all the Abacus at once after. So how about we come back at 9.30? Does that sound good to you guys? 9.30, and we'll, get, we'll jump into the fun Abacus examples. I think that sounds good to me. So I'm going to go refill my water, use the bathroom, stuff like that. Uh, you guys grab a snack. When we get back to the abacus, the, the fun's going to start. And if you guys have any questions, just throw them out in the chat. And once I get back, I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. All right, guys, I will see you guys back at 930. All right, guys, you ready for some more fun? <laughs> so this is going to be the question that we are going to do together in abacus. Nice and fun. And as you guys may have looked at the assignment this week, this is essentially your assignment this week. <laughs> so if you guys have a good understanding of this question, the assignment this week should be nice and simple. And that's what I want. I don't want the assignments to be brutal. That's what the final's for. <laughs> All right. So if we look at this question, it says using plastic material properties defined below. So below we have the engineering strain, engineering stress curve. Analyze the following plain stress dog bone specimen. The Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio of the specimen are 200,000 MPa and 0 0.3 respectively. Now it says the widths of the grips are 1.5 times the width of the middle. So that this distance right here and this distance right here, there's a relationship of 1.5. Other than that, the dimensions actually don't matter, which is kind of interesting. Now I got a question for you guys. If this is your assignment question, are you guys going to model that entire part? If you guys were to go into Abacus to try and analyze that, are you guys going to draw out this entire dog bone specimen all the way around? What do you guys think? So 
So we can't do the gray one only because our load is applied at this end over here. So that was a direct message I got. I don't think that you guys may have got it. And then we have a quarter. So the quarter is exactly correct. And this is why I had it open as a PDF, but I threw it back in Word and because of this. If I were to draw a horizontal line here, and let's just make the width of this bad boy pretty big. If I were to draw a horizontal line, is this symmetric in terms of geometry and loading? Is that symmetric? Yes. I got a direct message saying yes. Of course. And if I were to draw another line right down the center, something like this, put the weight up nice and big, change it to, I don't know, purple, is that also symmetric in terms of loading and geometry? Yes, exactly. So this is one of those things where this uh, the finite element people, if they see you model this thing as the entire thing, they, they typically get upset. They're very, uh, they can kind of be very cringy people at times. So this is what we call using symmetry. So in your guys' assignments, the first question says use symmetry. And what that means is that rather than modeling the entire shape, we can just model this quarter over here. And then what we do is we apply what we call symmetric boundary conditions to the bottom edge, and then a symmetric boundary condition to this vertical edge. And what Abacus will do is it'll know that this is symmetric. It's able to actually run the entire analysis just as one quarter. So this effectively reduces your run time by a quarter. So it's great, nice and simple. So the first thing that we have to do is we need to take this engineering strain, engineering stress, and find the new yield stress, which is the true stress, as well as the plastic strain. So I hope that when you guys see these types of questions, before we jump into Abacus, we have to say, all right, I need to figure out what these material properties are. Hopefully that kind of clicks for you guys. So, oh, let me just uh, take this. All right, so what we're going to do is we are going to go to our best friend, Excel. And I've already kind of hinted what we need to do. So these are things that we're given. Ooh, I should delete this too. <laughs> I, I spoiled the trick. I spoiled the nastiest trick in the book. But basically, we are given engineering strain and engineering stress. That's one of the things that we're given. Now, the first thing that we have to realize, and this is the trap. If, if a professor wants to screw their students, this is how they do it. They give you engineering strain in terms of percent, in terms of percent. When we deal with engineering strain in Abacus or the true strain, anything like that, it can't be in a percent. It has to be in units divided by units, or in this case, I'm doing millimeters divided by millimeters. So if I have my engineering strain as a percent, how do I get it into units of millimeters per millimeter or meter per meter or whatever? What do, what do I do? Divide by 100. Nice and simple. So all I'm going to do to find my engineering strain in terms of percent is I'm going to take the percentage value and then I'm going to divide by 100. Nice and simple. So I get 0. And then I just drag this down, and now I have my engineering strain. So again, this is a nasty trick. Make sure that if you guys are writing a final or an assignment, and that engineering strain is in a percentage, make sure you convert it. Please convert it, or else you're going to get marks taken off, and everything else will be wrong too. <laughs> All right. So now that we have our oops, engineering stress and our engineering strain, we can move on to the next column. And the next column, I put true strain. Now, you guys can do true stress first, true strain. It doesn't matter. The formulas are independent of one another. So let's say that I want to do the true strain first. What was my formula for true strain? Who remembers? What's my formula for true strain? Any takers? Oh, it all came in at once. So yes, it's going to be the natural logarithm. So we're going to go ln. And then inside, oops, cancel. And then inside, we go 1 plus the engineering strain. So we're going to have 1 plus our engineering strain, which is right here. I go enter. Good to go. And then I simply just drag it down. 
These are now my true strain components. How about my true stress? Who remembers true stress? Thank you. It's simply going to be our engineering stress multiplied by 1 plus the engineering strain. So this right here is going to be our engineering stress multiplied by, and I always try and go insert it here, 1 plus my engineering strain. So this right here, nice and simple. I go enter, and then I were to drag it down. So now I have my true stress, my true strain. But remember in Abacus, we're not inputting our true strain we import input. I don't know why I keep saying import. I don't know. <laughs> we input our plastic strain component. So who remembers the plastic strain component? And this is a formula you guys will always need to try and remember. Plastic strain component. This is worth the bonus points. Plastic strain component. Am I tricking you guys too much? I already closed out the PowerPoint. Ah, thank you. So we have our true strain minus our true stress divided by E. So this right here would be our true strain right here, true strain minus, and then I put in brackets, and then I have to go inside of these brackets. It's going to be our true stress, in this case here, divided by E, and we have E as 200,000. That was given to us right in the question. So again, I'm taking our true strain, and I'm subtracting our true stress divided by 200,000. I go enter, I get zero. Now, if I were to expand it, I see that right here, I get negative. What does this negative mean to us? What do you guys think? What does it mean if we have a negative plastic strain? It, exactly. I got a direct message so you guys can see it. It's essentially zero. There's no plastic strain. So we know for this region right here, it is still elastic. We can see that it starts to become plastic in this region right here. As we can see, our strain here is very small. So what I do is I do something like this. I say that this is going to be 600. Oops. This is going to be 600. And this right here is going to be zero. This is where I'm going to start my curve. And then I'm going to input all of these points. So these points right here, I'll put the nice thick border. That's actually not even that thick. <laughs> Maybe if I highlight it, it looks really gross. But these points right here, these are what I'm throwing into Abacus. Does that make sense to you guys? Does it make sense where I got all these components from? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Nothing? Yes. All right. I got a yes. Oh, and I got a thumbs up. That's so cool. Can you do a thumbs down too? I'm so curious now. Is it possible in Zoom to give the thumbs down? <laughs> oh, I probably don't want to know. All right. So these are our components and we're going to come back to these when we define our material behavior. So I'm going to put those away. I'm going to put those away. I'm going to make my screen all funky for Abacus so that it's not too small for you guys. So over here, we are going to zoom it to 225%. We just got to let it do its thing for a second. All right, good. Now we go into Abacus. It loads a little bit slowly because it has to check the licenses. And which screen will it pop up on? Oh, the middle screen this time. All right, so delete that, bring this over to the side. All right, can you guys all see Abacus? Is Abacus visible now? Thumbs up. <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do, as we said, is we're going to model this portion over here. And as we said, the dimensions do not matter. The only thing that matters is that this distance right here is simply 1 divided by 1.5 of this distance. This distance right here has to be 1.5 times this distance right here. 
That's the only thing that matters, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start off our model by simply going part. And I got to figure out where the hell it appears. Oh, it appeared behind the Zoom chat, of course. <laughs> all right, so we're going to start by creating our part. Now we can call the part whatever we want. For fun, let's just call it dog bone. Why not? Because that's technically what we are modeling. Now it's going to be a 2D part and everything else stays the same. We want it deformable. We want it a shell. And again, this pr approximate size doesn't actually matter as you guys are going to see right here. So I'm going to go continue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, here's my drawing space. And I'm going to use this button right here, which says basically create lines to start drawing the outline of my shape. That's all I need to do is I need to draw the outline of this dog bone and then Abacus will make it into a shape for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this right here. And what this command does is it basically creates a line between two inputted coordinates. So I'm going to start at zero comma zero. And as we can see, we can kind of create a line wherever we want. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that my dog bone here is 225 millimeters long. So I'm going to go 225 comma zero. And when I mean the dog bone, I mean the quarter of the dog bone. Okay. So another thing that we said is we want to make sure that this grip length over here is 1.5 times the length over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this length from here to here is going to be 50, 50 millimeters. Again, these dimensions don't matter. So I'm going to go 0, comma, 50. So now I got this length over here. Now what I'm going to do on the other side is I'm going to make sure that this grip length is 1.5 times 50. So if this is 50, then this length over here must be 75. So I'm going to click here, and we know that this starts at 225, and I'm just going to go comma 75. Does that make sense to you guys? Have I lost anybody yet? Hopefully not too bad. <laughs> All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this back a little bit to kind of have that last part of the grip. So we know that this is 225 comma 75. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, this comes back, let's say 25 millimeters, 25 millimeters. So this point right here would be 200 comma 75, something like that. Actually, should we make it a little bit longer? What do you guys think? Should we make it a little bit longer? Yeah, let's make it a little bit longer. So if we want to delete a part, there's an eraser button somewhere, but I'm just going to go undo. There's an undo button, but there's also an eraser button, but I think it's actually hidden below. So keep in mind, there's some features that you guys won't be able to see because I <laughs> enlarged my screen too much. So we ha currently had this as 25, but let's make it 50. Why not? So 225 minus 50 is 175, 175 comma 75, something like that. Not too bad. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a line that goes from this point over here, kind of across. So if this is 75, we'll go, we'll go 150. So I'll go from here all the way until 150, comma. Oops, not 75. I wanted to go 50. Undo. <laughs> we'll go from here all the way until 150, comma, 50. Because keep in mind that this height right here is 50, not 75. So I get this right here. So now the last part that I have to do, which kind of sucks about these dog bones, pull up word for a second, is I want to try and incorporate some sort of curve, some sort of curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this command right here, which is create ellipse. Now, if you want, you can create an arc too. I guess I'll just create an arc. And basically what we have to do is we have to input the center point of our arc as well as two points. So what I want is I want my center point to actually be right here where these two lines would intersect. Does Abacus have undo everywhere? Do you mean like in the property modules, stuff like that? Or what do you mean by everywhere? I'm a bit confused, sorry. In assembly, no, in assembly, it's much easier. I'll show you guys next lecture what we do in assembly. It's very easy to delete parts and move them around. In assembly too, there's a lot of fail safes that Abacus has. So if I were to take a part in the assembly and move it, before it actually moves, Abacus will move it there and then give you a, are you sure this is what you want to do kind of button? And then you can go yes or no, something like that. Hopefully that makes sense. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. All right, perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
put the center point of this arc over here so we know that this is going to be 150 comma 75. So as you guys are going to see in Abacus it's all about kind of creating your geometry in terms of coordinate points. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select one of the starting points and I'm simply just going to go around and click the end point just like that. So as we can see we now have our dog bone. Now it's weird because we didn't actually create a shape. We created a bunch of lines and connected them together. But if I were to go OK and say that this is good, so we have our part right here and I go done, Abacus already knows what shape I'm trying to create. So that's the first part, which is creating the dog bone. Is there any questions about that dog bone? Or are you guys pretty, pretty OK with that dog bone? Hopefully you guys are OK. <laughs> The silence always scares me. The silence either means it's, it's completely fine or you guys are completely lost. The problem with Abacus is if you guys are lost in an early step, then everything else becomes a little bit blurry. So hopefully you guys are pretty good. I got a direct message saying good to go. So I'm going to take your guys' word for it for now. So now that we are done our part module, we can move on to our second module, which is going to be property. And this is where we are going to define both our elastic and our plastic parameters. So just like before, we are going to click our button to create a new material. It pops up on the other screen. And we can call this whatever we want. So these parameters that we basically have right now, it's pretty close to steel. So what I'm going to call this is just simply steel. Make it nice and simple. Now if I go to the mechanical tab, the first thing I want to throw in is my elastic parameters. Those are the nice easy ones. So I'm going to come down to elasticity, and then I'm going to go over to elastic. Now right here, I have two parameters that I can throw in, my Young's modulus and my Poisson's ratio. So my Young's modulus was 200,000 MPA, and my Poisson's ratio was 0 0.3. By this point, you guys are experts at elastic parameters, so I'm not going to go too much in detail there. However, where it becomes new for us is those plastic parameters, right? the plastic parameters. Now, to find those, I go to mechanical again, but instead of elasticity, I go one down into plasticity. And as we can see, there's a bunch of different types of plasticity models. Uh, if I were to do concrete, I would do the concrete damage plasticity approach, stuff like that. But for us, we're keeping it nice and simple. We are going plasticity and then just simply plastic. Nice and easy. So right here is where we get that table that we kind of talked about before, where we have yield stress as well as plastic strain. But what's nice for us is we've actually defined what those are in our Excel sheet. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up our Excel sheet. And this looks really bad because it's all zoomed in now. And I'm going to take these parameters that we defined. And all we have to do is copy them because in Abacus, we can actually do the copy paste. So I'm going to highlight those parameters. I'm going to go control C to copy them. I'm going to go into Abacus and I'm going to paste them nice and simple. So if you guys are worried about trying to go on and on again with inputting each parameter separately, don't worry. Abacus has basically a command where we can just paste them. So how, how does that look? Because now we're actually done. Our material properties are good to go. Is it too crazy? Too advanced? Or are you guys thinking, ah, this is this is pretty easy? Hopefully pretty easy. Again, that overwhelming silence. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to trust you guys. So now we have our material parameters. I simply go OK. And everything else now remains the exact same as what we discussed before. So now that I have this material defined, I need to take this material and tell Abigail, hey, I want to apply that material to this shape over here. So the first thing that we have to do is create a section. And this section right here we'll call our dog bone section. We'll call it section two. Why not? We know it's solid. And it's homogeneous. So I'm going to go continue. It's going to say what material is associated with the section. Well, we only have the one material, so it's going to be steel. And plane stress slash strain thickness, we just keep as one. Good to go. So now we have a section to find, as we can see over here. Now we're going to take this section and apply it to our part. So I'm going to click this part right here that says assign section. It's going to say select which regions you want to apply it to. Well, of course, I want to apply it to the whole thing. So I'm just going to click it. I'm going to go done. And our only section that we have is our dog bone section. So by default, Abacus will have it as dog bone section. Good to go. 
I can click OK. And again, if everything works out well, this turns this green color. So now that we know it's this greenish boogery color, we're good to go. So we can move on to the next tab, which is going to be our assembly tab. Now, our assembly tab is the nicest tab for us thus far, because if we only ever have one part, we only have to really do one thing, which is import that part. So if I were to go here, it says, what parts do you have? Well, the only thing I have is my dog bone. I go, okay. My dog bone is now inputted into this part. Nice and simple. So now we're going to get into the fun stuff, which is the step tab. And we talked about this quite a bit. So we're going to go to the step tab and we are going to create a new step. So again, by default, we have that initial step where our boundary conditions go, but we want to create a step where we start to load this specimen. So I'm going to double click step, find out where the step command actually went. Oh, behind zoom chat again. <laughs> so now we have this and we're going to call this apply load. Now, if we look at the different types of steps down here, we see that we have general and then we also have RICs. Now, remember how I said that there was a way to apply load control while capturing the softening behavior. That right here is static RICs. And we're going to talk about that in the last lecture. But for now, we're sticking with static general, just like before. We go continue and then we get this menu right here. So notice how, like I said, Abacus by default will have our pseudo time period as one. And this is great because when we deal with incrementations, we can always kind of think of these in terms of percent. So if I were to go 0 0.01, that's 1%. If I were to go 0 0.27, that's 27%. If I were to put this as two, then everything changes. This 0 0.25, well, this is actually 12.5%. It all depends on this first step right here. But this time period, just always leave it as one. It makes everything else so much easier. Now, the only thing that we're going to switch in this basic description is this, NLGOM. Remember that we are now dealing with nonlinear analysis. Therefore, whenever we have one of those, we have to consider nonlinear geometric effects. How do we put that into Abacus? Well, it's simple. We just click this is on. That's the nice, most easy part of Abacus there is to be. But however, we're going to play with the incrementation a little bit. So before we said that linear analysis, it's always by default one to one, meaning that it always tries to go to 100% of the load in one step. We said, well, you know what? That kind of sucks. I don't want to deal with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to 10%, so 0 0.1. And again, the relationship between this increment size and this total load right here is this is what we're trying to get to, one. So if I have my increment as 0 0.1, it's going to go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way to 1. If I were to have this as 2, this time period, then it would go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way to 2 now. So this would actually be 20 increments. But again, it's easier to think of this as 1 because everything right here is now just simply a percentage. So we're going to have our initial step as 0 0.1 or 10% of our load. And we're going to also have our maximum. St Actually, we'll keep it as one for now. We'll show you guys what exactly happens. The other two, we are going to leave the same for now. So only thing I did is I decreased our initial step down to 0 0.1. I'm going to go continue. And now we can see that we have those two steps applied. So are we good so far? How are you guys feeling? I got to check up on you guys, make sure that everything is good. Good, perfect. So after the step, we have interaction. That'll be next week's lecture when we start talking about contact. In this particular one, we don't have any contact, so we go right into our loads. So question for you guys. We know that we have the one pressure load. What other boundary conditions do we have besides our pressure load? What do you guys think? We know that we're going to have to put a pressure load over on this end, but is there any other boundary conditions or loads that we need to put in? Yes, the symmetry. So remember that we said that we actually have a bunch of symmetry in this model. So I need to apply my symmetric boundary condition to this edge. And then I also need to apply my symmetric boundary condition to this edge over here. Where are those? Well, those are in boundary conditions. So I'm going to double click boundary conditions and we can call them whatever we want. So I'm going to go uh, symmetry one, just like that. 
and this is a boundary condition. So we'll throw it into initial. Now, as we can see, symmetry is actually located in this first one that's automatically highlighted. We're so used to going down to displacement, but as we can see, symmetry is in this first one right here. So I'm going to go continue, and it's going to say select the regions for this boundary condition. Well, let's start with the bottom edge right here, my bottom edge. Okay, so I'm going to go done, and then this menu appears over on this side. And as we can see, we have three different symmetries. Which symmetry are we going to pick? X symmetry, Y symmetry, and I'll just tell you right now, it's not going to be Z symmetry. Is this going to be X symmetry or Y symmetry? X. All right, so a lot of you guys said X. Now let's look at what it says about X. It says that U1, which is the horizontal direction, is equal to zero. All right, it says U1 is equal to zero. If I were to look at this bottom edge and I were to start pulling it, is U1 going to be equal to zero? I got a direct message saying no, it's not going to be equal to zero. However, if I were to take that bottom edge and pull it, all right, pulling. So it's moving horizontally. U1 does not equal zero. But is that edge moving upwards or downwards? In other words, is U2 going to be equal to zero? What do you guys think? If I'm pulling that horizontally, that bottom edge, is it moving upwards? No. So in this case, we know that this bottom edge is actually Y symmetry. Y symmetry. Because we can see that U2 is actually not going upwards. Y symmetry. That makes sense to you guys? It's, it's actually really confusing. When I first did it, I was always confused. But then I always look at that U2 and the U1. So that's our first symmetry. That was the bottom edge. Now we can have a second one, which we'll call symmetry two. And again, it's going to be symmetry. And we know that we're applying that one to this edge over here. So I'm going to go done. This menu appears. Now for this one right here, this edge, when I start to pull it horizontally, is this edge going to start moving vertically? Is this point right here, let's say this corner point, when I start pulling that thing, is it going to start moving horizontally? Oh, we're back. <laughs> Did you guys experience that too? I got the big old reconnecting. Oh. All right, guys. I think that we just lost connection. Uh, hold on. Let me throw up chat so I can see what you guys are saying. Share the screen again uh, and chat. All right, so I got chat up. Are you guys good to go? Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> All right, round two. Can you guys, uh, hold on, where's the chat? Can you guys hear me? Are you guys connected now? I, I saw that we were disconnected twice. All right, sorry about that, guys. Internet seems to be a little bit spotty today. All right, move this back over here. All right, so we're coming back. So the question that I had that we were, I, I'm not sure where you guys cut off, if I'm being honest. Now, we're looking at this vertical edge, vertical edge now. Now, this point right here, let's look at this corner point right here. When I start pulling this thing horizontally, is this corner point going to start moving downwards due to Poisson's effects? This corner point right here. Is it going to start moving down? Yes, it is. So right now we can tell that U2, because that's the vertical direction, that's not going to be equal to zero. However, when this point that when I start pulling, is this point over here going to start moving this way? 
Is it going to move horizontally? What do you guys think? Is this point going to move horizontally when I apply my load? The answer is no. And that's exactly correct. So in this case, we know that u1 is going to be equal to 0. So we can go x symmetry. Yeah, so I got a private message about this one right here. Yes, this, this one works too. This is kind of a more specific case. This is a more general case. Both of them work just fine. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. Because what this one will do is this one makes sure that you see these axes over here. This one is always in relation to this axis. So if this dog bone was over here, like let's say up here, and I were to use this X symmetry down here, well, then it would be mirrored all the way down here. Like there'd be that big gap. What this does is this is the general case that says the symmetry is right along this line rather than with respect to the global axis. So you can use either one because right now our X and Y axis are aligned with those edges. But if they were not, then we have to kind of account for that. So I go, OK, I now have my two symmetry boundary conditions. Now, the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to apply our load at this end over here. And if we were to go back to our Word document, we can see that the load is going to be 2000 MPA. Nice and simple. So I go, all right, I got my load. The menu pops up over here. We know that our load cannot be in the initial step. It has to be in its own step. And we're going to simply call this our tensile load. Why not? Tensile load. And we know that this is going to be a pressure. Remember, it said MPA pressure. So we're going to click pressure over here, click continue. And what we do for a pressure is we select the surface on which it acts in. So we're going to select over here, which is going to be our surface. We go done. And then basically, all we have to do is input the magnitude of that pressure. Now, by default, Abacus, if we were to put a positive pressure, so if I were to just go 2000, what that means is it acts onto the surface. Okay, it goes towards the surface. So if I were to go continue, as we can see, it acts on the surface. It's not tensile right now, it's compression. But we know that it's actually tensile. It acts away from the surface. So we actually have to go to it and modify it to be negative. Negative means it pulls away from the surface. So I go OK. I now have my pressure all the way over here. So now my loads are completely done. Is there any questions about the loads? Or are you guys comfortable with the loads? Comfortable with the loads, hopefully? Good, perfect, perfect. So the last step before we run our job, of course, is going to be our mesh. So I'm going to go to the mesh command. And the first thing I'm going to play around with, oh, got to go to part is I'm going to play around with the element type. So this bad boy pops up over here. So we're going to stick with plain stress. That's what the question told us. And we are actually just going to use linear quadrilateral elements, but we're not going to actually do reduced integration. We're going to take that off because we know that there is some uh, error, I guess, with reduced integration. And for these specific analysis, we want to see how close it actually goes to what we know. So we're going to disable reduced integration, but we're going to keep everything else the exact same. I'm going to go continue. And then we can mesh our part. So OK to mesh part? Yes. Now, how does that look for you guys? Look pretty ugly? Looks pretty ugly to me. So what we're going to do is we're actually just going to decrease the mesh size a little bit. And as you guys will see later on, dec like making a nice mesh size, it's, it's, it's an art form, really. There's many things you can do to make a nice mesh size. But for the purposes of this course, because we have time constraints, we are just going to keep it as the default. So the only thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to decrease the mesh size. Let's see what five looks like. That looks good. So then I'll mesh it like this. We have this mesh over here. So again, usually a smaller mesh, we get to our results faster. It just, uh, our results are more accurate, but the computation time kind of increases stuff like that. So now we are good to go. We have our material properties. We have our loads. We have our boundary conditions. We can create our job. So I'm going to go over to the job command, find out where it hid. It's always, it always pops up behind the Zoom chat, which always confuses me. All right, so our job, we'll call this uh, dog bone, and then we'll call it load control, because we are doing load control right now. So I'm going to go continue, and then the other menu, which again is behind Zoom chat. <laughs> we have this menu, again, unless you know what you're doing, probably you shouldn't touch it, we just go continue. And to submit it, we 
click it, we right click it, and then we go submit. Now, what do you guys think? Do you think the analysis is going to run? Get your answers in before uh, before we find out. You guys think it's going to run, or do you think it's going to say, you know what, Clayton, you're an idiot? What do you guys think? Oh, you know, I heard a no. Perfect. Let's find out. Ah, someone's paying attention until peak. So our analysis aborted. This is what happens when Abacus does not converge. So before we go into the results, let's right click it and we go monitor. So this is the thing I was showing you guys in the slide. So we right click, we go monitor, we get this menu right here. So as we can see, we started off with 10% of the load and it was successful, no problem. We did another 10% so that we can get to 20% total, no problem. Then Abacus got greedy. Abacus said, well, you know what? We did 10 twice. How about 15% of an increment? Well, Abacus said, well, that was unsuccessful. So then what it did is it went from 15% down to 3.75%. And this one was successful. So that one was actually good to go. Then the next one was unsuccessful. And you guys can try and figure out what Abacus is doing just from these increments. Now, if we come down here, we can see that Abacus was unsuccessful at this time step right here. So what Abacus did was it tried to lower it to this one right here. And then this one was also unsuccessful. Now Abacus aborted after seeing this one. And the reason why is because keep this number in mind, one times 10 to the negative five. When we go into our loads over here, we said that our minimum increment size was this, but Abacus diverged at that. So Abacus actually needed smaller ones to proceed. However, we said you can't do smaller ones. This is our minimum. So this is why Abacus actually aborted. Now let's take this real quick and let's go to the negative 10. All right, let's make it even smaller. Why not? Come down here and let's submit our analysis again. So the only difference is we now fix that problem with the minimum time step. So now it's going to be submitted again. And what's actually nice is we can monitor it while it's running. You don't have to wait until it to finish, abort, anything like that. We can actually monitor it while it is running. I was going to find out where the heck it popped up. Oh, it's over here. So as we can see, oh, here's all the iterations. It's going, it's going. But as we can see, it's starting to get stuck around this. And then it aborts again. Where it now went to our new minimum time step. And it said, well, you know what? To, to keep going, we still have to get closer. But if you will notice, and this is something I didn't really point out too well, is it's always failing at 0 0.274, around that area. 0 0.274. Let's figure out why. So we're going to exit out of this, 0 0.274, and we're going to look at our results. I look at our results, I do this, and we get this number right here, where this whole region over here is 937 MPA. 937 MPA. If we were to go to our Excel sheet, what was our last value of stress that we had? It was 937. So at this point right here, Abacus is trying to keep increasing the load, but this is already our maximum load. It's the peak load, as you guys said. So this is what happens. Now, the thing to keep in mind is just because our analysis aborted, it doesn't mean that the results still aren't good. Everything until this load is perfectly fine. So if I were to go, this is what's nice. Is remember how I said Abacus records all the successful increments. Well, we can actually view those increments. So here was 10%. Here was 20% of the load, 23% of the load, 25% of the load, 26% of the load, and it keeps going on until it ultimately failed at this step right over here. So that's actually really nice to see. It's a lot of fun. Now, I'm going to show you guys something that'll save you guys a lot of time in your assignments, a lot of time in your assignments, as well as your research. So up until this point, you guys have been probing nodes, right? Probing nodes, you click your little icon. It's a lot of work. No one wants to do that. So let's say what I'm interested in is the stresses in this element right here, the one right in the center over here. Well, rather than probing it a million times, we can actually create plots. So if we were to come down here to this XY command, create XY data and click it, 
we get this menu right here. Now it says, where do you want this source to be? Well, we want it as our field output, which is basically all this data that we have in our results. So we're going to click field output and we go continue. And we're given this nice menu right here. Now what this menu says is basically this. What do you want to plot? Well, let's plot our stresses. So let's plot our von Mises stresses. Uh, let's also plot sigma 1, 1. And you know what, for fun, let's also plot our strains in the longitudinal direction. So LE11. So now I got three different things here that I'm telling Abacus to plot. And then in the next tab over here, we say what elements we want to select. So we can either go pick from viewport or we can go from our sets. But I'm going to go from viewport. I'm going to go edit selection. And then I'm just going to click that element down over here. Now this is actually really big. I'm going to put it off screen. So we select the element that we want, or if we want to, we can select multiple elements, whatever you want, but we're going to select our element and we're going to go done. Now, if we go back to this menu, it says we have one element selected over here. We have what we want to plot. What I can do is I can simply go plot and I get this menu over here. Now what this does is it shows our stresses and strains, as they increased throughout, uh, sorry, as our time increment increased. So remember that at about 0 0.274, that's when everything started to quit. Well, as we can see, this is when our plot ends right here. We can see that our strain is rather linear. Our stresses go up like crazy. Now I got a, a weird question for you guys. How come I have four different plots of strain, four different plots of von Mises stress, and four different plots of sigma 1-1. One, one. Why do you think that happened? Shouldn't it just be one curve? Why do I have four curves for each value? What do you guys think? Ah, exactly correct. So I plotted this for the element. Now in the element, it has four integration points. So what these are the stresses, the strains, and the von Mises stresses at each one of those integration points. <clears throat> so this is the plot. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, the plot looks great, but what can I do with the plots? Well, we can take this plot and we can throw it in our best friend, Excel. So to do that, once we have the plot that we want, we can go report over here and then XY. All right, I'm going to say that again so you guys know. We go report and then X, Y. Click that and you guys have this menu right here. Now what we want to do is we want to plot or export the stuff in our current viewport. So we're going to switch this to the stuff in our current viewport. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick one value of strain, one value of stress, uh, von Mises, and then one value of stress, uh, sigma 1, 1. So just one of them, because as we can see at the integration points, they're all the exact same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three, say these are what I want. And then under setup, this is where the file is going to be stored. So what we're going to do is we're going to cl click select and you guys can specify where in your computer you guys want to store it. So I'm just going to throw it right at the desktop for right now, or I could throw it in documents. Uh, no, I'll go desktop, make it easier to find. And what we can do is we can name this whatever we want. So let's just call this Abacus. We'll call it Abacus Data. So I, I go OK, and then it actually puts this in, and then I can go OK to have it exported. Now, what we're actually seeing, and you guys can't see it, is this popped up on my desktop right here, Abacus Data. Now, what happens is when you click it, nothing's going to happen. How do we open this file? Well, we actually have to open it into Excel. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up Excel. I have to open up a new notebook because I have my old one going on right now. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> everything gets really weird once everything's all zoomed in. And what we want to do is we want to go File, Open. And I'm going to Browse. So if I were to go to my desktop, as we can see, it says there's nothing in your desktop, Clayton. You're an idiot. And the reason why is because we are only looking at Excel files. So what we actually have to do is we have to change this to all files, all files. And now we can see that our Abacus data now popped up. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
say that's exactly what I want to open. So then this menu comes up right here. And Abacus is kind of a, a data file, so it's really messy. So what we want to do is we want to go delimited over here, next. And we want to go tab, which is selected by default, but we also want space. So tab and space. We go next and finish. And as we can see, we now have all of our Abacus data for all of the time steps. So this right here, this is going to be our time step. As we can see, it went to 2 point, or 0 0.274. Nice and simple. This one right here, we can see that this is going to be our strain. So if you guys want to, we can call this our strain. The second one right here, we can see is our von Mises stress. So we'll go von Mises. And actually, I'll zoom in a little bit. Our von Mises. And then this last one here is sigma 1, 1. And this is nice because now we can plot it ourselves and make some comparisons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot our strain and stuff like that. So Insert, or we'll do a plot like this. Uh, select data, we'll just remove it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot our von Mises stress as a function of our strain. So for our x, we're going to keep it as our strain. Oh, where'd it go? Usually you can see it, can't you? Uh, confusing. All right, and then for our von Mises stress, we're going to just select this right here. Go OK. And go okay let's see if that plotted correct okay so this is what we got so this is abacus's plot of our von mises stress versus our strain now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our old friend over here and we are going to plot our true stress and our true strain so this is what we inputted into abacus basically so i'm going to copy this i'm going to post uh, post this one over here and we're also going to plot that one as an additional series. So the X value would be our true strain. The Y value is going to be our true stress. What can you guys conclude? What do you guys think? Is there a difference between the true stress and the true strain and our abacus's results? Are they the same? Are they different? What do you guys think? They're the same. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a smart ass here and say, well, they're not really the same. Look, there's a, there's a difference right here. Is that difference expected? Why is there a difference here? What do you guys think? I'm just playing with you guys, of course. They are the same. And the reason why we have a difference here is because Abacus, remember, it doesn't evaluate it at every point. It evalu evaluates it at specific increments, and between those increments, it assumes that it is linear. So that's what's going on here. If we were to add more increments to make it a very small increment size, then we would actually have the exact same thing. It's because our increments were so big. In Abacus, we went from this point here all the way to this point over here. We kind of made a big jump. That's, that's what happened. Yeah, but keep in mind that it's again because we're making those increments. So this point right here, this this is where our points are, it's switched. And keep in mind that these are also curve fitted because I did them in uh, Excel. Let's see if we can change the chart type. Nah, I can't. They're the exact same. If you guys were to plot it as the point charts, so if you guys were to do it as one of these, you guys would see. Now, the thing is, they're exactly the same for plain stress. Exactly the same for plain stress. Are they going to be exactly the same for plain strain? What do you guys think? Are they going to be exactly the same for plain strain? Let's see if I can change the chart type. 
See? The only difference is where the points are located. But it goes back to my question for you guys really quick. Are they going to be the same for plain strain? All right, I got a private message saying, I don't think so. And that's actually the right answer. I don't think so. Well, actually, no, that, that's not the right answer. The right answer is going to be no. They're not going to be the same. They are not going to be the same. Now, um, actually, I'll show you guys why. So let me just exit out of this. There's, we're going to play with Abacus a little bit more. Uh, we're not going to save this. We're not going to save this. I'm going to open up PowerPoint. And, oh, it's going to be really zoomed in. <laughs> I want to just go to this last slide. Remember that Abacus said that yielding is based on the von Mises stress. Now, when we do plain stress, plain stress, what is sigma 3 3 in plain stress? What is sigma 3 3 in plain stress? Zero. Exactly. Is sigma 3 3 in plain strain equal to zero? No. Exactly. And that's why. When we start dealing with plain strain, our von Mises equation changes. And that's why in plain strain, you guys will not get the exact same things in terms of input curve and stuff like that. So that was load control. Now let's go back and play around a bit. So we're going to go back to our loads. And we're going to say, you know what, load control, uh, let's suppress it. Let's, let's not do the load control anymore. Let's do displacement control. So instead of applying a load, I'm going to apply a displacement at this end over here. So I'm going to go displacement, and we'll call this our tensile. Displacement. So displacement continue. We're going to select this edge. And what we're going to do is we are going to pull it, let's say 50 millimeters. 50 millimeters. That's a lot. You think about it, I'm almost extending the shape by like what? 30%, something like that. So what do you guys think? If I'm pulling this by a lot, is the analysis going to run? I'll create the analysis right now. We'll call it dog bone. Displacement control. So place your bets. Is this analysis going to run? I am really stretching the crap out of this thing. What do you guys think? Any bets? No bets? All right, well, let's, let's run it. Let's try. Let's try. That's, that's a great one. Private message saying let's try. So remember, I'm, I'm really stretching the crap out of this thing. Let's see what happens. It's submitted, so it's creating that file right now. It's running, it means that it's starting to run the file. Let's see. If we want, we can monitor it to see what's going on. So we're at 22%. Oh, now we're at 51%. Oh, it completed. It completed. So what we're going to do is we're going to go see those results. So for those of you guys who are saying it's going to abort, pay up. It actually completed. So now we're going to look at the results. Now, what do you guys expect is going to happen when we click the deformed shape? Is it going to be something very special? <laughs> it's going to blow up. Now, does that look realistic to you guys? It didn't blow up, but it essentially blew up. Because what we have to understand is this is now garbage. This results like these are completely distorted. They're garbage. So what we're going to do is we are going to plot that exact same element. So the same things. Actually, let's just plot the stress. So we're going to take off the strain. We'll take off sigma 1, 1. We're just going to plot the von Mises stress. And we're going to select that element. So I'm going to click that same element that we had, the one that's right in the corner. And I'm going to go. Plot. As we can see, it reached that point over here of that yield stress of nine, 937-ish, and then it just went on forever. And that's the thing about displacement control. Remember when I said in Abacus, that last plasticity point that you guys input, Abacus just extends it out. And that's what we see here. It 
ran perfectly fine. And then it hit that point, And then it was like, see you later. I'm going on forever. So you guys can keep going on. Eventually, you guys will get an error saying that these elements are highly distorted. Be careful. <laughs> so this is one of the things that uh, we have to watch out for. Now, the last thing I want to kind of discuss here when it comes to this scenario. Did Abacus give us any message saying, hey, this thing failed by tension. This thing failed by shear. This thing failed by bending moment. Have you guys ever gotten a message from Abacus saying that this thing failed by so-and-so reason? I'm, I'm curious. Have you guys? No. I got a private message saying, nope, nope. Abacus will never tell you if something has failed. Abacus will never tell you why something has failed. So this is why we as engineers have to be aware of what exactly is going on here. If you guys were going to a conference and present your findings and you guys were to give them that curve with the big extended line, ooh, I, I, I don't want to be there for the questioning period. We as designers have to realize, hey, it failed as soon as it started to plateau. Something that we have to check. So it's just something that we have to be aware of. So that's it for really this abacus example. Is there any questions about this one? Any questions at all? Can we define softening? Yes, we can. So here's the thing, and I got, and this will kind of answer a direct message I got about Mahmoud asking if we can import input a zero point. So in the plastic point, we can input softening. So if I want to, I can say, all right, well, after 937, it goes down to 900, and we can keep going down. What you do not want to do is to go like this, nice and flat, and then input zero. Because what happens is that creates a crap ton of nonlinearity, and your analysis just won't run. So that is something that you don't want to really define. You, what you guys want to try and do is define a nice gradual softening. Okay, so you guys can put zero, but... Be warned. It's one of those things, too, that once we see, even though we didn't define any softening and we had their results the way that we did, where is our results? Why can't I find it? <laughs> All right, let's go right-click it again, or even this one. Right-click, results. We can see that severe yielding has already occurred. So we as designers know that it already failed. We don't really need to make sure that Abacus tells us that it failed. Common sense will show us. Yeah, it failed. That makes sense to you guys? All right. So that is this right here. So is there any other questions about this example? We're going to take a quick little skedaddle into E-Class and look at the assignment this week. Just, I wanna go over the assignment and just see how you guys feel about it. So this is the assignment this week. This question right here, it's basically identical to what we just did, except we made it a little bit nicer because we didn't have the little grips at the end. It says employ symmetry. You guys now know symmetry. All we're basically looking at is for you guys to extra extract the true stress versus applied load for two cases, plain stress and plain strain. I've already given you guys a hint. For plain stress, we expect the exact same results as our input. This says true. Yeah, we'll keep it as true. However, for plain strain, we already said that this is going to be different. So that's question number one, nice and simple. Question number two is the exact same thing, except I want you guys to look at the stress along this edge right here. So now you guys already know in Abacus how to export things. You guys already know how to get it into Excel. So if I wanted this edge right here, I can first create a plot. And instead of the integration points, I can switch this to the nodes. So unique nodal. And I can go stress down here. I can go over to my viewport, click edit selection, and I can select all of those nodes. Then I can go plot just like this, and now I have this plot. So we can see where the failure kind of occurred. It's obviously right here where everything starts getting wonky after that. But what we can do is we can export these into Excel, and we can see how the stress changes over that curve. Oh, I got a good question. So one question is direct message saying, why didn't we choose axisymmetric parts 
in this up here. So if I were to go to parts, and you guys are asking why we didn't click this, this is a whole different ballgame. This is not having to do with symmetry about a specific part. It's symmetry about an axis. Oh, well, that's, a, that's a hard one to describe. Let me go over to the board over here, and I can show you guys what axis symmetric what that one really does. It's kind of like an extrusion around in a circle when something's revolved. So let's do a new share. And I was going to start sharing anyway. So what happens in axis symmetric is what I would do is I would define a vertical axis like this. And then what I would do is I would define my element or my part to look something like this. Now, what it's going to do in that axis symmetric option is it's going to take this part that we defined in 2D and it's going to revolve it around an axis. So an example of this is if I were to do something like a cylinder, if I wanted to do something like a cylinder, and I'm a terrible artist, guys, so uh, no judging, please. So if I wanted to model a cylinder, what this would be is essentially the cross section of one of the cylinders. So this part right here, this would correspond to, let's say, a slice of that cylinder. Axis symmetric is completely different to what we were doing over here. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Probably not. Yes, oh, I got a yes, so hopefully. All right, so I'm going to go back to the plot that we were talking about. And what I basically want you guys to do in part two of the assignment is we're going to create a graph like this. Now in this graph right here, we are going to have that edge. So remember that we basically have an edge that's right here where we have the hole and we have this. So this right here is going to be that edge that we want. So we're going to plot the distance of this edge. So this would be the part, let's say, nearest to the circle. And this part right here would be nearest to the actual edge over there. And what we're going to do is we are going to plot the stress versus applied load. So this is going to be sigma. And then this will be our applied load. So let's say that our applied load, P equals 1. You guys will get a graph that looks like this. And then we say, well, you know what? Now we're going to check P equals 2. Your graph will start to look like this. And you guys will go P equals, let's say, 5. Your graph will even start to go like this. So hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense on what the question, what we're going to do for the question in the assignment? This P right here, these come from your increments. So if I were to apply, let's say P equals 10, and I were to do my increment size as 0 0.1, then Abacus will record 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 10. Nice and simple. Sound good? For the second question, I got a direct message about asking about the X and Y symmetry for the quarter circle. Well, it's still going to be the exact same. The only difference is we are going to have a hole over here. This edge will still be symmetric. Now, because I don't want you guys getting too confused, if we look at the second, that's the wrong one. <laughs> don't save. I want E class. I don't ask you to use symmetry in question number two. In question number two, if you guys want to model the whole thing, go, go, go for it. I don't ask you for symmetry in question number two. But if you guys want to, it'd be the exact same thing. The only difference is, is this is now the edge, and then this is now the edge, because it's still symmetric. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, not sharing? Of course I'm not. All right, hold on. <laughs> uh, share. So for this question, I don't ask for any symmetry. Symmetry is restricted to question number one. You guys can use symmetry for question number two, and it's going to be the same thing. This edge right here will be symmetric, that edge AB, and then this horizontal edge will be symmetric too. That's it. So again, the ultimate stress is 1,200. So what we're doing is we're basically going to apply a load at 1,200, and then what we're going to do is, as let's say, 100 MPA, plot the stress distribution along this line. At 200 MPA, plot the stress distribution along this line and keep going and see how that stress distribution changes with the applied load. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So 
So is there any questions right here? Oh, I guess one last trick. So it says the plate has a thickness into the screen of two millimeters. How do we define that in Abacus? How do we define that into the plane thickness? I'm trying to get all the questions you guys may have out of the way. The plane thickness option, exactly. So if I were to go down to my sections, plane stress or strain thickness, two. You guys are experts. See, this assignment's going to be so easy for you guys. You guys are going to be laughing by the end of it. So is there any questions about the assignment, the content, anything at all? And yes, for those of you guys who are, keep asking me about contact, next lecture. We're getting into contact, the, the big dog, if you will. <laughs> Alrighty, well, if there is no questions, of course, I'll stick around. But if there's no questions, uh, that's it for today's lecture. A little bit early, so you guys get to celebrate an extra 10 minutes, I guess. <laughs> the stress is at the edge. Sure. So go like this. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go to my, well, I'll go to the job that I've already defined. So let's go to this one. Let's go to the load control. So here we go. And what I want are basically these stresses at the edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my XY data field output. And then we get this menu over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the stresses. I want my Von Mises stresses. And I want them over the edge. So I'm going to go to elements or nodes. And I'm going to go, actually, there's a couple ways you guys can do this. Oh, why is this not working? Oh, it's because I need to select it. Oh, it's because I didn't select you. Oh, it did. All right, hold on. It's because I'm trying to play between these two different analysis results. All right, now I'm going to go back to this one. Things will get messy. All right, so now let's try. Oh, perfect. Yeah, this one, we have our stresses. Now we can edit our selection. And what we're going to do is we are going to select those nodes at the edge. So as we can see, all the nodes are now highlighted. So then I'm going to go plot. And now we have the stresses of those nodes along the edge. As we can see, they change during the different timestamps. Now, I, I, this is the von Mises stress. I think that yours is a little bit different. And this one's because, yeah, the, the thing is nice. Yeah. So all you guys are going to do is then export this into Excel. And basically, at each timestamp, you'll have the stresses for each node. So at this point right here, let's say 0 0.05, there's actually one value for every single node. And then you're just going to plot it across. Does that make sense? Maybe if I export it, maybe you guys will. So if I were to export it into Excel, X and Y, I'm going to select all this data. So every single node, node 1, 2, 11, etc. I'm going to put it in the exact same spot. I'm going to go OK. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Excel. I'm going to op uh, open up that file. It's in my desktop. Remember, I have to go all files. We go fix, uh, we go delimited and space finish. We get this right here. So what this is, is the timestamp. Remember, the timestamp is the percentage of the load that we applied. So in this case right here, we applied 2,000 MPA. So we know that the load applied is simply going to be 2,000 multiplied by our timestamp. So if I were to bring this down, we can see that the load here is 200. At load 200, I now have the stresses along my edge, because these are the stresses at the elements. At load 400, I now have the stresses along the edge. At load 450, or sorry, 475, I now have my stresses along the edge. So does that make sense to you guys? Hopefully. Yes, perfect, perfect. That's the hardest part of the question. After that, you guys will be perfectly fine. <laughs> 